I was 11 years old, I decided to give my life to Christ. I got baptized when I was a baby, and uh, when I started actually coming to church, I was 11, and I didn't really pay attention. I just wrote on paper and didn't really watch, but when I went to North Point, I started watching and seeing what they're talking about, and now I understand. I was raised, you know, Catholic, and I've always, I've always known Jesus exists. I've, I've always been taught that, but I, I never had a relationship with Jesus. I've been coming to North Point, and I've been getting a little bit more engaged in actually reading the Word, which I've never done before. So, um, I, I did like a couple um, life groups, and God has answered a couple of my really specific prayers that I've had. I'm hearing him telling me that I need to give my life to him. Since I've decided to more closely follow Jesus in the last couple of years, um, he's been changing my whole outlook on life. Relationships with people, I mean, my outlook on work, my outlook on you know raising my children has completely changed. This is something that's been happening over time. Um, but he's really softened my heart to a lot of things that I kind of had a hard heart about with the emphasis on loving others. I feel like I've been more like kind and like more like trying, like trying to do stuff more than just lay on my couch and waste my life away. Like I've been trying to listen to what other people are saying more and like understand what other people are coming from other than just be straight up mean. To me, this signifies like a starting over or um, a new life in Christ. And I think it's important for me to be a spiritual leader for my family, for my kids and show an example, so. Baptism is Dedicating your life to Christ and following him like a leader. He is a leader of heaven and stuff, but following him like Christ. It's definitely never too late to get baptized. You're never too far gone. <laughs> um, it doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been in life. Um, what your beliefs were in the past. It's never too late to get baptized, to come to Christ and give your life. Stacy, I just want you to repeat these words. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. The Son of God. The Son of God. And He's my Lord and Savior. He's my Lord and Savior. Because of that, I'm baptizing you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sammy, I'd like to, for you to repeat those words too. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. The Son of God. The Son of God. And He's my Lord and Savior. And He's my Lord and Savior. Because of that confession, Sammy, I'm baptizing you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I became sick in 2016 and it took them a while to figure out what was wrong with me, but I had Lyme and I had another co-infection and I was having a very hard time just living. Um, I used to lead Bible studies and form D groups and I taught teenagers and I led homeschool groups, every church that we moved to. And then I moved here and I got sick and everything stopped. Uh, chronic Lyme and the other, the other illness disease that Deb has is brucellosis. Both of them impacted really every part of our life in terms of what we could do. Um, in the morning, we'd, we'd have plans for what we we're gonna do later in the day, and I, and I would just say, how you doing? And um, on the days that, that Deb was impacted the most, it was like, we're not doing anything. And when she was when she was at her worst, she couldn't think, couldn't process, couldn't do much of anything. And um, and it was it was harder 
uh, obviously on her, the knee, um, because there was this sense of, is this what life is gonna be like for the rest of my life? This year, I think in February, said to me, we're going on a mission trip to Sri Lanka. I'd really like you to go. And he knew how my life was. So I was like, no. And he goes, will you pray about it? And I thought, yes, I can pray about it. We met with the group that was going, and I was just sitting there with everyone. And I leaned forward and said, so what are we going to do in Sri Lanka? And everybody was like, what? And I thought in that moment that I did not say those words. That was the Holy Spirit. And so when I got home, I knew, I knew then that God wanted me to go to Sri Lanka. And from that point on, I had peace, which made no sense. And my kids especially were like, wow, mom, that you're not nervous. You're not anything. I said, right, I'm almost not even excited. I have so much peace. I kind of had an idea of what that would be like. If God told me to go to Sri Lanka, he was going to make me feel good. So we go to Sri Lanka. I felt terrible. It was hot and humid, which causes Lyme flare. And I just could hardly get up in the morning. I went to church on October 8th, and worship was phenomenal. Rick began to speak, and he started telling stories about Sri Lanka. So I'm listening. Yes, he starts his sermon about 20 minutes in. All of a sudden, it was like a shudder lifted, like something clicked. And I knew, I knew within two seconds I had been healed. I wasn't sitting there. I hadn't fasted. I hadn't prayed that moment to be healed. I had prayed lots of moments to be healed, but not that moment. And that was October 8th. And I have felt wonderful. And I have been back to church and people are seeing me. And I have energy and I can start to do all kinds of things. I'm working in the nursery. Um, I'm trying not to get ahead of the Lord, and I want Him to tell me what He wants me to do because obviously He healed me for a reason. And just trying to listen to Him and continue to grow closer to Him um, so I can, this new chapter, um, I can do what He wants. You know, that makes whether you lost or won a football game seem pretty small. <laughs> um, God's alive. And he's working. Um, that's the short version of Deb's story. If you want to see more, there's a 14-minute version that we're going to post to Facebook and to YouTube. Um, later today, and it tells a little bit more of the story. And love to have you watch it. Love to just celebrate God's goodness. Um, in 1985, Deb and I moved from Columbus, Ohio, to Rockville, Maryland, to begin serving as the associate minister at the Church of Christ at Manor Woods there in Rockville. The church averaged about 180 on a Sunday morning, and I was their first full-time associate minister. I was 25. The senior minister at Manor Woods was a, a man named Ken Mead. During the 12 years that I served with Ken, uh, he became my mentor, my friend, my racquetball opponent. Uh, he and his wife became surrogate grandparents for our children because we lived 550 miles from home. Ken was a man of integrity, a godly man who loved his family, a pastor with a shepherd's heart. Ken preached the message that I want to share this morning every fall at Manor Woods for 25 years, the same sermon. He preached it again at his son-in-law's church for the last time when he was 86 years old. I'm preaching from his notes this morning. And his message was based on a sermon first preached in 1915 by a, a preacher named Clarence McCartney in Philadelphia. McCartney preached the same sermon 40 years in a row, the last time in Pittsburgh in 1955. Paul finishes his second letter to his friend Timothy with these words from deep in his heart, knowing that his life on earth is about to end. 
for I'm already being poured out like a drink offering and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will award to me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he's done. You too should be on, on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Anesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. Eubulus, Eubulus greets you, and so does Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you all. Napoleon Bonaparte and the Apostle Paul are probably the two most renowned prisoners of all history. One was in prison because the peace of the world demanded it. The other, he sought to give men peace that the world can't give and which the world can't take away. Napoleon said, I love nobody, not even my brothers. So it's not strange, therefore, at the end of his life when Napoleon, when Napoleon was banished to a rock prison in the South Atlantic that he said, I wonder if there's anyone in the world who really loves me. But Paul loved everyone. His heart was the heart of the world. And from his lonely prison in, in Rome, he sent out messages to come alongside him. Paul had three such friends. The first of these three, whose name needs no mention, is the one who is the friend of each of us. The friend who laid out his life for us. Jesus. The second was that person whose face is usually the first and often the last that we see in life. The physician. This friend Paul handed down to immortality with that imperishable introduction. Luke, the beloved physician. And again in the passage that we just read. Only Luke is with me. The third of these friends was the, was the young Timothy. Who Paul affectionately called my son in the faith. The last letter Paul would write in all of his life was to this dearest of his friends, Timothy, whom he left in charge of the church in far off Ephesus. He tells Timothy that he wants him to come and be with him in Rome. He's to stop at Troas along the way and pick up his books. For Paul continues to study even to the end of his life. He, he's to bring his cloak as well because Paul had left his, his cloak at the house of Carpus in Troas. It's getting cold in Rome, for the summer is fading out, and Paul wants his robe to keep him warm. But most of all, Paul wants Timothy to come to himself. Do your best to come to me quickly, he writes. And then just before the close of the, of the letter, do your best to get here before winter. Why before winter? Because when winter set in, the season for navigation closed in the, in the Mediterranean, and it was dangerous for ships to, to venture out to sea. Just as traffic on the Great Lakes all but stops in the winter, so it was in the Mediterranean. If Timothy waits until winter, he'll have to wait until spring. And Paul has a premonition that he's not going to last that winter. For he has just written, the time of my departure is at hand. We like to think that Timothy didn't wait a single day after he got that letter from Paul. 
uh, after that reached him in Ephesus, and he began to make the journey to Rome. Before winter or never, there are some things that will never be done unless they're done before winter. There are voices speaking today, which a year from today will be silent. Before winter or never, how quickly autumn passes. It was just a few weeks ago that we saw the beautiful leaves turn vibrant shades of fall in all their splendor. But the rain falls, the wind blows, and the trees are stripped and barren. Every change of season brings home to us the sense of the preciousness of life's opportunities, their beauty, but also their brevity. Taking our suggestions then from this message of Paul in the prison in Rome to Timothy in far off Ephesus, come before winter. Let us listen to some of those voices which are now speaking so earnestly to us this morning, which a year from now may be silent. There's the call first to be a better person before winter. Uh, McCartney wrote, as men stand before the furnaces of the steel mill with tongs in their hands, ready to seize the fiery coils and direct them to the molds, they must hurry. If the iron is permitted to cool below a certain temperature, it refuses the mold. There are times in our lives that are best for us to make changes and become better people. You must resist each temptation while you still have the desire to do so. If you conquer it now, you may well be the master of it forever. Those good things that you've planned to do, do them now before winter. There's the voice too, the voice of friendship. Suppose Timothy didn't leave right away, that he procrastinated and finally made his way to the ship and is told that the season for navigation is over and that no vessels will sail until springtime. He saw the sign, no ships for Italy until April. All through the anxious winter, we can imagine Timothy reproaching himself that he didn't go at once when he received Paul's letter and wondering, he's wondering all that time how Paul's doing. Imagine him arriving at Rome the next spring and being cursed by the guards. Don't you know that Paul was beheaded last December? Every time the jailer put the key in the door of his cell, Paul thought you were coming, Timothy. His last, his last message for you was this. Give my love to Timothy, my beloved son in the faith, when he comes. How Timothy would then have wished he had come before winter. It might well be before winter or never. Buried in, the, in this passage, we read together these words. Demas has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone on to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in ministry. I mentioned last week in my message that I wanted to talk about Mark today. Paul's writing Timothy about the Mark that's mentioned in Acts chapter 13, who was also called John Mark. Paul and Barnabas leave their missionary journey to share the gospel with John Mark as their partner and assistant, their helper. They sail from Seleucia to Cyprus, and they travel all the way across the island to Paphos, where they share the good news about Jesus with Sergius Paulus, the assistant governor of the island. But when Paul and Barnabas are ready to leave Paphos and sail to Perga, Mark has had enough, and he returns to Jerusalem. Enough adventure, enough stress, enough time on the road. He's ready to go home. We don't hear of John Mark again until the end of Acts 15 when Paul and Barnabas are ready to go on their second missionary journey, to their second journey to go out and tell people about Jesus. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul didn't think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. When Paul writes to Timothy at the end of his life, 
and asks him to come and bring the things that he needs, a good winter coat, his books, his writing utensils. What else does he say? Get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in in my ministry. Sometimes the thing that we desperately need to do is to forgive, to admit we were wrong, and to recognize that the hard line that we drew in the sand wasn't all that important. Come before winter and admit you were wrong, that reconciliation is not a sign of weakness, but of a rich blessing you'll never experience without taking that step. The disciples complained when uh, Mary anointed Jesus with expensive perfume. And Jesus said, what? The poor you'll always have with you, but me you won't always have. That's true of the friends that we love. You have friends that have passed away that you'll never get a chance to talk to again. You'll never have a chance to mend your relationship with. In Haddington, Scotland, over the grave of Jane Welsh Carlyle, are written these words by her husband, Thomas. For 40 years, she was a true and loving helpmate of her husband, and by act and word worthily forwarded him, as none else could in all worthy he did or attempted. It's been said that the saddest sentence in English literature is the sentence written by Carlyle in his diary after her death. Oh, that I had you yet for five minutes by my side, that I might tell you all. We cannot treat our loved ones as if we will always have them with us. Cherish what is dearest while you have it near you, and don't wait until it's far away. One of the early occasions when Mr. McCartney preached on this text in Philadelphia, there was present at the service a student in the Jefferson Medical College. When the service was over, He went back to his room on Arch Street where the text kept repeating itself in his mind, come before winter, come before winter, come before winter. And he wrote a letter to his mother. Shortly after, he received a telegram. Come home at once. Your mother is dying. He took a train that night to Pittsburgh, arrived at the farm, and his mother was still alive with a smile of recognition and satisfaction on her face. And he saw under her pillow was the letter that he had written. The next time he saw Mr. McCartney, he said, I'm so glad, so glad that you preached that sermon. Jesus took his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray just before he was betrayed. The 14th chapter of Mark's gospel records, he took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Twice he returned and found them sleeping. And then returning the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. Never again would Peter, James, and John be able to watch with Jesus in his hour of agony. It's easy to intend to do something, to speak a word of appreciation or to show an act of kindness. But when that moment passes, it may never come again. There's a call to be a better person before winter. There's a call to take actions to take action with your friends and family before winter. But the most important action to take before winter is to respond to the voice of Jesus. I I wish I had been there when Jesus had called his disciples on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. There must have been this sense of love and confidence in Jesus, but even more a sense of immediacy and urgency in his voice when he said to those men, come, come. Follow me, because they left all and follow Jesus. Eternal life is suspended at the call of Jesus. That's why the Holy Spirit never says, oh, do that tomorrow, but always today. Scripture says now's the accepted time. Now's the day of salvation. The reason for this urgency is twofold. 
None of us is guaranteed tomorrow. And our heart, hearts might change. An old rabbi used to say to his people, repent before the day you die. But they would say, rabbi, we don't know the day of our death. Then he said, repent today. Come before winter. Today, a person may hear this message and be interested, impressed, almost persuaded, and ready to take, to take their stand for Christ and enter into a new life with Jesus. But if they postpone their decision, they may never make that decision. On October 25th, 1981, the following column entitled Heavy Hearted Observer appeared in the column Ann Landers. Yesterday was an old man's birthday. He was 91. He awakened earlier than usual, bathed, shaved, and put on his clothes. Surely they would come today, he thought. He didn't take his daily walk to the gas station to visit with the old timers of the community because he wanted to be right there when they came. He sat on the front porch with a clear view of the road so he could see them coming. Surely they'd come today. He decided to skip his noon nap because he wanted to be up when they came. He has six children. Two of his daughters and their married children live within four miles. They hadn't seen him for such a long time. But today was his birthday. Surely they'd come today. At supper time, he refused to cut the cake and ask that the ice cream be left in the freezer. He wanted to wait and have dessert with them when they came. About nine o'clock, he went to his room and got ready for bed. His last words before turning out the lights were, promise to wake me up when they come. And they never came. It was his birthday and he was 91. I, I hope the Holy Spirit's been prompting you during the message this morning and that you've been convicted to do quickly whatever you need to do in order to show love, compassion, and concern to someone else. It might be to a family member. It might be to a close friend or a neighbor or anyone else that the Lord has brought to your mind this morning. Once again, I repeat the words of the apostle. Come before winter. Do what you know you ought to do before winter. Do what your heart tells you to do before, before life is over. Make that phone call or write that note today to tell someone, I love you. Or thanks for all that you've done for me. Or I'm sorry. Or I forgive you. Go to that one who needs you. Maybe to do a deed of kindness. Maybe to express gratitude or appreciation. Maybe to seek forgiveness. Perhaps just to be with them. Make that decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life. We won't know until eternity why God chose to heal Deb's symptoms of chronic Lyme and brucellosis and why he doesn't choose to heal others of our family or friends who love him and also suffer. But our sense right now is that Deb's healing was tied to her obedience to his prompting to go to Sri Lanka. God had prompted her to go. She didn't want to. It would take her out of her comfort zone. It would exact a price on her body and on her mental health that would be significant. And still, she obeyed. We don't obey God's leading because it's easy or because we think it somehow obligates God to change our circumstances. We obey God's leading because he's God, because we're his creation, because he loves us and we love him. And sometimes in our obedience, God opens up a whole new world to us. 
In March of 2021, my niece was getting married just outside of Washington, D.C. Deb and I went out a day early, specifically so that we could visit with my good friend, Ken Mead, and his wife, Jan. We hadn't seen them for about five years, and we hadn't really communicated much with them, except their annual Christmas card that they sent us, and we didn't send back. That afternoon, we talked and laughed about their kids and grandkids, about our kids and grandkids, about the house that they had remodeled during the pandemic, and some of the great things that God had done during our ministry time together. Three hours flew by, and the 25 years since we had moved seemed like just a blink of an eye. Ken and Jan were full of life and energy. They hadn't changed really a bit at all. There were a few more wrinkles, a little less hair, moving just a little slower, but they hadn't changed. They were the same Ken and Jan, filled with the same joy for the Lord. Three weeks later, Ken was out mowing the lawn, waving to the neighbors with an infectious smile on his face when in the blink of an eye, Jesus called him home. Come before winter indeed. A few weeks before our trip, I had wrestled with whether or not to take that day off and go early to spend the time with, the the time with Ken and Jan. There were things that I needed to do here, things in the office, that kind of thing. I am so grateful that we went. The joy the four of us had together that day so outweighed anything I could have done in the office. It's almost laughable. That thing that you need to do, your come before winter moment, may not have the immediate and dramatic results that our trip did, but then again, it might. Come before winter or never. Let's pray. God, there's a whole lot of stuff going on right now. A whole lot of faces in our minds. A whole lot of relationships that, that need attention. God, there are steps that we need to take personally. And Lord, there are some who are hearing your call. Help us, Lord, to not just put this aside, but to act. To act today, to act with decisiveness. God, to follow your lead. God, through those actions that we take, transform the world, transform our world, transform eternity. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Hey, we're gonna stand and sing. And if you wanna get right with Jesus, if you wanna take a step, I'm gonna be right down here. Just come down. Let's talk. Let's stand together.